it's delightful to be here, and I'm so excited to tell you all about pentagons, which are so beautiful and interesting. Uh, so, for example, here and in your hands are examples of some periodic paths on the pentagon that we'll find out about. So, um, our goal in this talk, if you wish to accept my goal for you, is to understand periodic billiard trajectories on the regular pentagon. When I say pentagon, I mean regular pentagon. Um, and here's the plan. So the pentagon is a little bit <laughs> complicated. So what we're going to do is we're going to do all the things for the square, where things are sort of more familiar and easy to understand. And then we're just going to do them for the pentagon afterward. So it's sort of like a warm-up problem doing them for the square. So that's the plan. I'll explain how the things work for the square, and then we'll generalize them to the pentagon. Got the plan? Got the plan. OK, so what are billiards? Billiards um, is the study of a particle bouncing around inside a polygon. Now, if, you, if it's the game of pool, there are pockets. Your ball goes away. We don't have those. We want to keep our ball around. So it's just a point mass, a particle moving around, where the rule is the angle of incidence equals the angle of reflection. Um, I'll do this with a polygon. You could also do it with a smooth shape, such as an oval, but we'll do it with polygons. Um, and that's it. No spin, no friction, no nothing. It just bounces around forever. So here we go. So for instance, if you're interested in periodic paths in the square, here are some examples. You could just have a path going back and forth horizontally, or maybe a diamond-shaped path, or maybe this more complicated one over here. Period, And we say we, this one has period two, just has two bounces. This one period four, because it does four bounces before it repeats. And that one period six, just the number of bounces it does. OK. Um, and here are some periodic paths in the pentagon. Aren't they so beautiful? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So beautiful. <laughs> so some of you are holding these, in fact, in front of you. OK. So here's a technique that people use to study billiards. So if you have a billiard trajectory, this is a billiard in a square. It's bouncing around a lot. Gosh, it's so complicated. This path is going in four different directions. That's just really complicated. I'd like to make my life easier. So the way that we do it is we say, OK, when it hits this edge, Instead of reflecting the billiard trajectory down, I'm going to reflect the table and make a new copy so my billiard trajectory goes straight. And then when it hits the next edge, we'll do the same thing. We'll just reflect this across, and so on. And then I'd make it go up. And if we keep doing this, we'll basically just get a line on a piece of graph paper. So if you're thinking about a billiard trajectory in a square, it's the same as studying a line on a piece of square graph paper, which is easier. Um, so there you go. And this is a powerful technique, uh, especially for things that tile the plane, like squares, because it makes it easier to analyze. So for instance, here's something we can prove. Uh, the slope of a trajectory is rational, like this one, it has slope 2, if and only if the billiard trajectory is periodic. And um, I didn't write out a whole proof. It's an if and only if proof. So I, as you know, I'd have to prove two directions. But the general idea is if you have a rational slope, the trajectory is eventually going to hit a corresponding point. Meaning like this one, I think it's 3 quarters of the way along. Eventually, it's going to get to another point where it's also 3 quarters of the way along. And then it's going to repeat. So that's basically the proof. Um, and similarly, if you have something that repeats, well, it means that it got to the same place twice. So there must be, it must be a question. So that's the idea. So periodic trajectories, which are the one that I like, in the square correspond to rational slopes. OK. So in the square billiard table, a, tra a trajectory with rational slope, p over q, is periodic, with period 2, plus, two times t plus q, and we'll prove that. They look something like this. I like to think of these as sort of like basket weaves. They all look sort of like basket weaves, like, a, like if you're weaving in a basket. They all make these uh, rhombuses. On the other hand, if it, the slope is irrational, it's going to fill in over more and more and more the longer you let it run. Until it looks like that. So if the slope is irrational, we'll never get to the same place twice, so it'll just fill in. Um, so what do you think? Which is more likely? If you take your billiard ball, you put it down on a square table, and you just hit it in any old direction, which do you think is more likely? Dense. Dense? Why? Because there are more irrational numbers than rational numbers. Yeah, nice. Yeah, dense. Um, in fact, dense with probability one, because there are more irrational numbers than rational numbers. The rational numbers are measure zero on the real line. Nice. OK, so, so yeah, if you hit a ball, it will fill in the table completely if you let it go long enough. Uh, but I like this rational case, because things are nice, the periodic case. Sometimes I had to sell it pretty hard. When I go to conferences and I tell people I'm working on periodic things, they say, oh, no, no. 
that's the easy case. You want to work on the, the non-periodic case. And I say, no, no, listen, look at the pictures, you'll understand. Okay, so I'll just tell you, um, regular polygons like the square and the regular pentagon exhibit something called optimal dynamics, which is if you hit your ball in some direction, it, there's two options. It's either periodic or it's equidistributed. Equidistributed means it fills in the whole table evenly. So it fills in, yeah, yeah that's what it means, equidistributed, equally distributed. So here's some examples for the square and here's some examples for the pentagon. Okay, and we'll talk about that a bit more later. Okay, so here's my claim. My claim is that periodic directions on the square torus and billiard table have rational slope. We already proved that. And my claim is that uh, the slope, the, the period is, um, well, for the torus is P over Q. So what a torus is, it's, um, yeah. So it's a square where we identify the top to the bottom and we identify the left to the right. So identify means if you're going along, you're like a little bug living on the torus, you get to this point, well, you're magically on this side again. And then if you go up, and you're here, you're actually over there. And then you hit the top, you're down here. Okay, the sides are identified. And so if we shoot this with a rational slope, um, you might wonder, how many times will I go around before I get back to where I start? So I'm gonna call the period the number of times you hit the edges. And then you can see that it should be P plus Q. This one it's, has a slope of um, three-fifths, and a slope is like rise over run. So if the slope is three-fifths, it means it rose three times, so it hit the top one, two, three times, and it ran five times. So it hit the right side or the left side one, two, three, four, five times. So you can see it should be P plus Q. P on the top, Q on the right. So there you go. You might wonder, now, why are you talking about the torus? Check this out. If I want to turn this into a billiard table, boop, I just have to put in all the negative slope points. So neg slope negative three-fifths. And now, every point on the right and every point on the left, they're not the same point anymore. Now it's a table and we're bouncing. So now we have P on the top, P on the bottom, Q on the left, Q on the right. Our period is two times P plus Q. So, I didn't prove this. People have known this for a while that a trajectory with slope P over Q on the square billiard table has period two times P plus Q. But what I want to know is, what's the period of a trajectory in a given periodic direction on the pentagon? We'll talk about what the periodic directions are for the pentagon. Suppose you have your favorite periodic direction and you give it to me, and I say, okay, and I hit the ball in that direction, how many times is it gonna bounce before it repeats? This was my burning question, starting in like 2010. That was a while ago, think of where you were in 2010. I was wondering about it. So this is what we're going to try to prove. OK, so here's a useful tool. And this is the aforementioned dance video that went viral, a clip from it. It's a shear. Those of you who have taken linear algebra know that a shear is just, well, it's, it's, a, it's a shear. No, it's, it's, it preserves a line in one direction, and then it pushes everything else parallel to that direction, depending on how high it is. So there's. Even if you've taken linear algebra, you might not love and know the shear because often people say, reflections, yay, rotations, yay, dilations, yay, shears, eh, whatever. But I say shears, ah, they are great. So we will use this tool, the shear. It preserves a horizontal line and then push things horizontally or vertically or whatever direction you want. Okay, so this is joint work with Samuel Lelievre, who's a mathematician at Université Paris-Sud. And there we are in his office in June 2015, starting to work on this project, or actually continuing this project. Um, so here's the idea. As I said, we're gonna do things for the square first and then go to the pentagon. So we're gonna use these shears. This is a horizontal shear, um, and this is a vertical shear, and uh, generate every primitive lattice point. Okay, so just so you get familiar with these shears, I said this wouldn't require any math background, and it, and it and it doesn't, because I'm going to tell you what they do. This blue shear takes the whole first quadrant, the whole part that is shaded, and takes it to this blue part. And the red one takes the whole first quadrant that's shaded and takes it to the red part. And there's lots of ways to make that happen, but what it does is it takes the two standard basis vectors, these two black vectors, to the blue vectors, uh, 1, 0, and 1, 1, and then the red one takes it to the red vectors, 1, 1, and 0, 1. Okay, so that's what it does. Let's see if we can make these things work for us. Okay, so here's the game. 
We start with just two points, one, zero, and zero, one, and we apply both of these vectors over and over. So if you apply, well, if you apply the blue vector to this point, it stays where it is. And if you apply the red vector, it goes here. And if you start with this point and you apply the blue vector, it goes there, the red vector. Okay, so you, the first thing, if you apply all the matrices to all the points you have, you just get this new point. Let's try it again. Let's apply these matrices to all three points. Well, we get these two new points. And now if we apply just the red matrix to all the points we have already, we get these two new points. And if we apply the blue uh, vector uh, uh, shear to these five points we already have, we get these two new points. And so on. If we apply the red ones to all these points we already have, we get those four new ones. And then if we apply the blue to all these ones, we get those four new ones. And so on. And then we keep going. Um, and you might notice that each time we got, we got one, then we got two, then we got four, then we got eight, and now we're getting 16. So we're getting all these things. And we're getting some points, but there are some points that we're not getting. We didn't get this one, we didn't get this one, we never will. Um, and that's because this generates, what it generates is the points that are visible from the origin, which you could call primitive points. So you imagine that at every lattice point in the whole first quadrant, there's a tree, like an, or in an orchard. And you are standing right here at the origin, looking out. And so this generates all the things that you can see. So you can see this tree, yes you can, but you cannot see this tree here at four comma two because it's blocked by this tree here at two comma one. So this process generates all of the visible lattice points. Cool, very, very cool. Um, but what, is it, what do we care? Well, these are our lowest terms periodic directions. So if you, yeah, so if you want to, you um, have a slope, you hit your ball in that direction and you wanna know what the period is gonna be, it better be in lowest terms, p over q. If you don't put it in lowest terms, it's not going to work. So these are lowest terms periodic directions. There's no 4, 2. Okay. That's the game. So it also has a side effect of giving every visible point a tree location. It's kind of like a zip code. If, you, if this is your favorite point, this yellow point here, well, how did you get there? Well, you start either at one of, uh, either one of these two points, and without loss of generality, we're going to pick this one. And then you did matrix... 1, 0, 1, and then 1, and then 0 to get there. So it's kind of like a, it's like a unique address for every point. OK. Um, and it also puts a tree structure on all the points. So that one was 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, but all of them have this kind of thing. Um, I don't know, this, point, this picture looks sort of tangled to me. I want to take a hairbrush and just sort of brush it out. Well, I did that. So this is what it looks like. And so for whatever your favorite fraction is, p over q, maybe your favorite fraction is 2 over 3, you can see how complicated it is by seeing how early it arises in the tree. So it's kind of like a measure of complicatedness. And these are all of our periodic directions. Okay, so here's the game that we're going to play. Suppose your favorite slope is 42 over 5 comma 6. That's a vector. Now, I know this is a rational direction, so it's going to be periodic. But I don't know what the period is going to be in this direction. I'm going to have to get it in lowest terms. Um, lots of you have a pen and a paper in front of you, so you could, if you wanted, reduce this fraction. That would be fun. But let's do it in a different way. So here's what we're going to do. This vector, 42 over 5, 6, is in the blue sector. So we're going to apply the inverse of the blue matrix. Doop. We get that new point. Now we're in the red sector, so we're going to apply the inverse of the red matrix. Get to here. We're still in the red, so we're going to apply the inverse of the red matrix. Now we're in the blue, so the inverse of the blue matrix. And now I didn't tell you, but these sectors are uh, closed on the bottom and open on the top. So this is in the red sector. And so boop, we're going to get to here. So each of these matrices, it's easy to write the inverse. It's, you just actually put a negative right here. Um, and so it's easy to multiply that vector by these matrices and figure out what point you get. And the point you get is 6 over 5 comma 0. What we really wanted to start with was 1, 0. That was the point that we started with. So, uh, so we should scale everything down by a factor of 5 over 6. So let's do that. If we scale everything down by a factor of 5 over 6, it turns out that our point was 7, 5. So if you shoot your ball in that direction, the period is 2 times 7 plus 5, which is 24. Well, this is a great way of um, solving my burning question for the square. And now we can go and do the same kind of thing for the pentagon. Um, so let me tell you about the friend of the pentagon, which is a surface called the double pentagon. So 
instead of defining the surface for you, I'm just showing you what it is. So this is two pentagons in these two different orientations, and opposite parallel edges are glued to each other, just like in the torus that we talked about at the beginning. So if you lived on the surface, like Libby does, if you walk across one wall, you'll just end up on the other wall of the same color, kind of like in Harry Potter, platform eight and three quarters. Right? Nine and three quarters? Nine and three quarters. It's okay. <laughs> Okay, so this is the double pentagon surface. Uh, this is what it is. Okay, um, the double pentagon has a friend called the golden L. Unfortunately, nobody has yet made a dance video about the golden L, but it works in the same way. If, if you or Libby or someone else lived on the surface and you walked across the green edge, you would reappear on this edge. Um, the dimensions of this, this is a rect rectangular surface, rectilinear surface, and the dimensions are one, well, this is one, this is a one by one square. And then these are little golden rectangles. And the golden, so I'll write down the golden ratio. So the golden ratio uh, usually denoted by phi, which is one plus the square root of five over two. Okay, but we don't care so much about this. We care about the awesome properties that it has. So it has the property that it, phi is equal to 1 plus 1 over phi, for example. So this little dimension here is 1 over phi, and so 1 plus 1 over phi gives you phi, and so on. So this little rectangle here is actually in the same aspect ratio as this bigger rectangle here. That's how the golden ratio is chosen. Um, it's a magical number. Sometimes people say it's the number, it's the ratio of a rectangle so that if you cut off a square, you get a small rectangle in the same dimensions, in the same proportions as the original one. Okay, so that's the golden ratio. And uh, the reason that we're using it is because you can cut and paste the double pentagon into the golden L. This is the mind-bending part of the talk. So you take this picture on the left, and in your mind, you go, and you get the picture on the right. Can you do it? You take the picture on the right, and you shear it to the right, and it will give you the picture on the left. Can you see it? No? I keep trying. Yeah, so they're, they're, if you shear one, you get the other. Yeah. So the golden L is easier to use because it has right angles. So we're going to use that for our computations. Um, this is why I work with Samuel. So I am an expert in the double pentagon. I made my dance video in about 2012. And Samuel is an expert in the golden L. He wrote a paper about the golden L in about 2013. So we were very well matched. He came up to me one day at a conference and said, hello, my name is Samuel Lelievre. I liked your video. <laughs> Let's talk about the golden L. <laughs> it was great. Uh, this is a picture of us sailing in Boston uh, last summer, 2017. You can tell it's Boston because it has this building and also the Sigo sign. Okay. <laughs> and I have to say it's very appropriate because he studies the golden L, and there are a lot of L's in his name. And you study the Pentagon, and there are five letters in both first and last name. So we, one way to talk about a periodic direction is that it's a direction with a rational slope. And another way would be that if you have a grid of, of like a graph paper grid, it's a direction that goes from vertex to vertex. You agree? That gives you rational slopes. Can only have, yeah. So what are the periodic directions on the golden L? They're directions that go from vertex to vertex when you unfold the golden L in the particular way that you have to do. If you go across the top edge of a square, you get one of these sideways rectangles and so on. Okay, so those are our periodic directions for this. Um, <laughs> did somebody lean against it, maybe? Okay, maybe not too much. Okay, you do it. Great. So, so this is still, we're calling our burning question. If I shoot my ball in a periodic direction, uh, what, is the, what is the period? Okay. So here's the deal. 
before, you could think about it as we put a square in the corner of the first quadrant, and then we divided the first quadrant into two sectors, that blue sector and the red sector. Sorry. <laughs> No. We for sure have two settings. Can you try like preset number three? Preset number three turned them all off for some no. reason. It's you not try the old presets? Okay. Or Good. four maybe? Four used to be. Yeah. Oh, yes. oh, yes. Four is not good. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. That's okay. Okay. Oh, four? Four. Okay. Good. Four is good. You can see me. Maybe I'll just stand in front. Um, so now we're going to put a golden L in the first quadrant, and we'll just divide it into four sectors. Instead of just by slope one, this is uh, slope one over the golden ratio, so about 0.6. This is slope one, and this is slope golden ratio, so about 0.6. And so it goes through these parts of the golden L. And you can see these are the shears that take the entire first quadrant to these four sectors. So we have the four color-coded sectors accordingly. And again, there's multiple ways to do it. We choose the ones that take the standard basis vectors to these purple vectors that I've put here. And those are chosen uh, so that the matrices have determinant one, so that they're area preserving. OK, so we're going to do basically the same thing. Suppose we start with a periodic direction, which we know because it's from unfolding golden L's, like this one. This is a periodic direction. This, you will see, it's in the yellow sector. So we're going to apply the inverse of the yellow matrix. Now it's in the blue. So we're going to apply the inverse of the blue matrix. Now it's in the green, inverse of the green. And now we're on the edge. So as you recall, we're technically in the red. So we get down here. And now we get to, there to some point. And again, it's easy to um, find the inverses of these matrices. You just put a negative sign in front of here. And so here now, we are, we are too small. We want it to be at 1, 0, but we're too small. So we're going to scale everything up. And then we get our, our good point. So last time, we wanted uh, a point that was like an integer, comma, an integer. And now it turns out we're going to get something of the form a plus b times the golden ratio, comma, c plus d times the golden ratio. It's not clear maybe that that's what's going, what's going to happen, because we take 1, 0, and we multiply by these matrices to get back out there. Because when you multiply these together, you might think, oh, but you get phi squared, because you get a phi times a phi. But the amazing thing about the golden ratio, if you multiply through this equation by itself, by phi, so maybe I'll do that in another color. So if we multiply this equation on both sides by phi, you see that phi squared equals phi plus 1. So anytime you get a phi squared, you can bring it down so that you just have uh, constants and constant multiples of phi, an integer, in fact, multiples of those. So we'll get something of the form a plus b phi, c plus d phi. OK, so the theorem that we proved is that this, tr this tree, meaning multiplying, meaning multiplying by different combinations of these matrices generates all of the periodic directions and that they're all of this form, a plus b, phi, c plus d, phi. Now, you don't necessarily get everything that's of this form, but everything you get is of this form. <laughs> OK, so still my burning question, what's the period of trajectory in a given periodic direction? And once we had put together all this structure, it was like right there. Can you see it? It's like right there. Like we were grasping for it, like it was so close. Like we can almost answer our burning question, but we can't quite. But what we did have was all this structure that we could use to draw beautiful pictures. So um, this is the first bits of our tree in terms of direction vectors. So if we start with 1, 0, and we multiply by each of those matrices, which I've just color coded, well, these are the ones that we get at the first round. And then if you multiply by each of those matrices again, well, these are the ones that you get. Well, I'm sure you, you love this picture. It's just so beautiful, but maybe it would be better uh, in pictures, so I'll show that later. So you might wonder, okay, for each of these vectors, um, what does it mean? And so what it means is um, first you do some matrix, then you do some other matrix. So uh, its location in the tree is just which matrices you had to multiply to get there. So for our example point, we multiply to get back out by matrix 3, and then 1, and then 0, and then 2. So it would be at location 3, 1, 0, 2 in the tree. Like this one is like one and then two or something like that. Okay. So we can use these to draw pictures and that's what we did. Because we couldn't prove our theorem, we at least wanted to draw lots of beautiful pictures. So at tree location 3102, the one that we've been using as an example, look at this beautiful picture. Right? 
it, it's practically like art. And it existed, just nobody had never ever seen it until we discovered them. Here's another one, 102. Pretty nice, yeah? 130, all these nice places in the tree. 101, I kind of like this one. It looks to me like you're looking into a tunnel. 2000, I like this one. It looks like a pentagram, meaning a star inside a pentagon. And my, my advisor studied the pentagram math, and so I have a particular fondness for those. But we still wanted to know, what's a period of a trajectory in a given periodic direction? So we have this program, and it did these things. And this was my burning question. Incidentally, it wasn't Samuel's burning question. It was only my burning question. So we made a table. So on the left here is the tree location, like 2, 1, uh, matrix 2, and then matrix 1. Here is the period. We had the period. OK? And then here is the lattice vector. And I was thinking, like, maybe it's just kind of like the, um, the square. Maybe you just take the coefficients, and you add them together. And you maybe, I don't know, multiply by 2 or something. Who knows? Because for the square, it's 2 times p plus q. So maybe here, it's like 2 times a plus b, or 2 times who knows. And Samuel said, like, no, that's going to be ridiculous. Like, so I said, can we please graph the period against the sum of the vector coefficients? I want to know what it looks like, because I'm, I'm thinking it's going to be a linear relationship. And he said, no, that's, that's, there's no canonical way to make a vector. Like, for instance, if you started out with some vector like, oh, I don't know, uh, phi comma 1 plus phi, that's a direction, and the sum of the coefficients is 1, 2, 3. But if you multiply this thing by the golden ratio, you'll get, what, phi squared, one pl uh, phi plus phi squared, which is 1 plus phi, uh, 1 plus 2 phi, and the sum over here is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 5. So it's not canonical. Like a direction is a direction, but the vector isn't canonical. He said, you're just going to get a cloud of points. And I was like, come on, I just want to see it. And the problem at this point was that I wasn't very good at programming. So it was much easier, it was faster and more efficient for me to say, hey, Samuel, could you please program this? <laughs> and, and then for have him to program it than for me to figure out how to program it. So that's what I did. I said, could you, could you please, could you please program it? And we tweeted, what do you think it's going to be? Something pretty. Something pretty. That's right. Yeah. It's a line. And it's a line with, well, slope 1 half in this case, which is what we wanted. The period is 2 times the sum of the coefficients. So exactly like 2 times p plus q. It was like the most beautiful thing that happened all year. <laughs> but it happened in February. <laughs> so, that's the, so that was our theorem. The period of the direction of this lattice vector a plus b phi, c plus d phi, that we get from our algorithm is exactly 2 times a plus b plus c plus d. So back when it was like, it was so close, you were grasping at it. Yeah, there it is. So, so that was a great victory. We solved it. Isn't that so great? Yeah. It does, insights like that don't happen all the time. So when they come, you have to celebrate. Yeah, okay. So there is our burning question, and there is our answer, just so you know. We, we did it. We it off. Yeah. Great, right? Question? Well, you had some nice data. Oh, yeah, the proof. Yeah. Yeah, the proof. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, so I, I thought I have, I have slides for the proof, and I decided not to put them into this talk. It's, it's because it's the proof, I can tell you how it works. It's like over here you have the vector, and over here you have the sum of the coefficients, and it's like a proof by induction. If you hit it with a, vector, with a, a matrix, it does the same thing on both sides, and it just all works. It's not super inspiring. Sorry. No, no, that's okay. Yeah, I know. Yeah, we did have to prove it. We did. We, we did. <laughs> Uh, 2000, February 2015, and it took until February 2017 to break down proof. <laughs> so it's like not super fast. Okay, so now that we're done with the question we wanted to answer, and we still have like 29 minutes or 19 minutes or whatever, we can just play with what we got and have fun. So that's the plan for the rest of the time. We get to play with it. 
So let me tell you about buddies. So in every direction, in, so this is the double pentagon surface. Suppose you pick a periodic direction, such as parallel to a side. Well, this is, this is a periodic trajectory because it goes to the midpoint here, it reappears on this other edge, it keeps going, and now it's back to where it started. So this is just, if Libby were dancing in a line, she would just be going across like this. But it's very much, if, if she just danced a little bit to the left, it would kind of be the same, right? And if she danced a little to the right, it would be the same. Like nothing different would happen. So it's a whole family of trajectories. And if I drew them all, they would fill out this blue area, which is called a cylinder. It's called a cylinder because, well, it wraps around this way, but not this way. So it's like a cylinder. Um, and then, but as soon as you slide it all the way down and then you hit this vertex, it pops across and then it's different. It's like this red one. So it turns out that in every direction, every periodic direction, there are two fundamentally different trajectories, a short one and a long one. And the long one, as you may guess, is golden ratio times as long as the short one. Okay, and then if you want to turn this into a billiard trajectory, well, you just fold it up. It's easiest to see up here if we fold it across this edge, we will get that picture over there. But the billiard trajectory isn't done. If you want to finish it, you have to do five copies of it to go around. So we would get this billiard, this nice pentagon looking billiard trajectory. Whereas down here, if you folded this up, you would get a star looking trajectory. Pretty neat. So here's a gallery of some parallel trajectories. So here I've drawn the long one, there I've drawn the short one, and at the top I've drawn them together. And the way you can tell that they're friends, they're buddies, they're parallel, well, they have parallel pieces in them. Just those pieces are parallel, those pieces are parallel. You get the idea? Okay, so let's see some pictures. So here's one. You can see it has some parallel parts in it. This one is golden ratio long, times as long as that one. Beautiful, right? Pretty nice. One thing, yeah, one thing you can notice is that where one of them has dense spots, the other one tends to have an empty spot. So they kind of fill in nicely together. This one, pretty nice. This one. Now, if you look at these two down here, you might not think that they really resemble each other, but you can notice that they, they both have these spikes. So they kind of have a family resemblance that you can see. And how about these? These are not, don't have rotational symmetry. They're still nice. This one, I like this one because the top one has a lot of parallel lines that you can see. Yeah. Okay. So there's something that I didn't tell you, which is that I was only telling you actually about the period of a trajectory on the double pentagon, not even the billiard table. And beyond that, I was only telling you about the short trajectory. So for the long trajectory, it turns out you just take this thing and multiply it by the golden ratio. Because of the phi squared equals one plus phi thing, uh, you end up adding an extra b and an extra b. So for the long one, it's two times a plus two b plus c plus two b. I hope you will forgive me for brushing this under the rug on the first pass. Okay, good. How about symmetry? Let's talk about symmetry because some things, as you just saw from this gallery, some things have rotational symmetry and some of them do not. So, some of them have only reflection symmetry. This is a really nice example of that. You can see this trajectory, it, it bounces out perpendicularly, so it comes right back and then bounces out perpendicularly, it comes right back. So this has period four, even though you might think it looks like it has period two. Um, and then this other one has reflections, has rotation symmetry and reflection symmetry. So here's how you end up with only reflection symmetry. This is a periodic path on the double pentagon. I've drawn a different copy of the pentagon for each time that it goes across, but you can see it's periodic because it gets to this edge, just about this distance from the edge, which is the same as this edge, so this distance from the edge. So it's gonna repeat. Now let's fold this into a billiard trajectory. Ready? Shoop, shoop, shoop. Okay, and it got back to where it started. So the double pentagon period is the same as the billiard period because it just folds right back up. But check out this one. If we fold this one up, it's not back to where it started. So you need five copies of it in order to get an actual billiard trajectory. So if you want the billiard period, you have to multiply the double pentagon period by five. So in case you want to know about some other examples, there's this one. This is periodic because it goes right from this midpoint of this horizontal edge to this one. When we fold it up, we only get one fifth of the path. So we have to do it a bunch of times. 
This is period four of the double pentagon and period 20 over on the actual pentagon billiard table. And this one, if you, but it, this one, if you, if you uh, fold it up, it, it just folds right up and it comes back to where it starts, so it has period six on both. So this one, the periods are equal. So this is actually the, the whole theorem, maybe. If we want to know about the pentagon billiard period, it's two times a plus b plus c plus d, that's the double pentagon period, if the trajectory has only the reflection symmetry, and if it has um, the whole rotation symmetry as well, you have to multiply by five. Okay, so there's the whole question. There's the whole answer, now that you are, you know, have all the information. Oh. Okay, so I personally am uh, more fond of the paths that have rotation symmetry. All of you have a pentagon in front of you, maybe. How many of you, okay, look at it. Pick your favorite side if it has two sides. Decide if it has rotation symmetry or not. Flip it over. Yeah. The, some of them have it on only one side. That would be the side that you should look at. The <laughs> side. So how many of you have your favorite side has rotation symmetry? Okay. How many of you your favorite side has only reflection symmetry? Yeah, okay, good. So about the same proportion, you know, five, six, one, six, about the same proportion as uh, as in real life. Okay, so so about five times as many paths have a rotation symmetry. So it's good that most of you like the ones that way. So, uh, but for those of you who like the ones with reflection symmetry, here is a gallery. Ready? Okay, and again, um, the blue one is the short one, and the red one is the long one in the same direction. Pretty nice, right? They have a certain aesthetic to them. I like to think about which pentagons people like as a kind of a Rorschach test for personality. <laughs> so the people who pick the nice symmetric rotational ones or the people who pick the ones that are kind of random looking says something about your personality. So what would you think of if someone had this as their favorite? <laughs> no. Okay. And the last thing I'd like to tell you about is families. So this is a very exciting uh, topic that I just discovered in January, and I'm very excited about it. Okay. And this is, if you saw the teaser video at the beginning, those were families. So recall, because it's been a few minutes, that using the four shears, we put a tree structure on the periodic pentagon directions. This gave us a tree structure. So this tells you if you if direction vectors, you know, you start with one zero, you multiply by some matrices, you get these other things. This is okay, but it would be better with pictures. <laughs> so here are the pictures. So if you start um, with a horizontal trajectory, so that's parallel to an edge, you could just get this pentagon. And then if you apply the matrices, you get this nice gallery of pentagons. And some of these are beautiful. Some of them, many of them you have. I especially like the ones that come from this. This is a tree, it goes way down. So I've only shown you the first two branches. But from each of these, there's four. From e this one, there's four. There's four. It's a very, very bushy tree. Okay. So for instance, from this one, there's these four beautiful next trajectories. They're so beautiful. And this number is their location in the tree, like that zip code that we talked about. Okay. So because they're very beautiful, I wanted to make them, but I wanted to bring them to the people. So I wanted to bring the beauty of mathematics to everyone. So I wanted to make them into earrings. Anybody wearing Pentagon earrings? Yeah. Okay. Um, and there's a box of them somewhere. Um, so, but there's infinitely many periodic trajectories. I can't make them all into earrings. So ideally, I, you know, I'd make a whole bunch. And then people would order them, tell me which ones they wanted, I'd send them to them. But I didn't want to make infinitely many, I didn't even want to make 100 different designs. I only wanted to make like maybe 10. Um, so I, I made a website that, uh, puts, that just puts all the pentagons from the first four levels of the tree, so up the tree word with four digits. And I sent it to people. I sent it to my mom. I sent it to my friends. I said, can you please tell me which trajectories you like the best? OK. So. This is a question for you. Which one do you like the best? I mean it. Pick one. There, the, so each column is the same. So pick the column that you like the best. As an earring? 
Well, <laughs> so just so I mean, I, I I meant maybe to have just only this size available for you to pick. So those of you who have picked one of this size, this is this size. Uh, you can that that's your favorite by definition because you picked it. But that's the question. If you had a pile of these, are a pile of these. This is actually the same as the earring boxes coming around. Which one would you pick? The one with the hole in the Okay. Just, just, oh, no. oh, sorry. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. So everyone pick the one that you like the best. Anyone need more time to pick the best one? Okay. How many of you picked this column? Yeah. So it turns out, good, good choice, good choice. You all are friendly and get along well with others. <laughs> <laughs> So it turns out that something like 50% of people all pick the same one. Um, and the other 50% pick different ones. And they're all beautiful. And I agree, this one, this one you meant? It's nice, right? Yeah. Yeah. So they're all very nice, especially the 10 that I picked to put on <laughs> earrings. Um, but somehow this one is like the best. Somehow the universe has spoken that this is the most beautiful billiard trajectory. Now, when I have people look in the box or, or take a hand, look at a handful of, of them printed out, they pick this one. Um, when I have them look on the screen, they pick this one. But look how similar they are. So the earring one is, is this one. The two green ones are the same. And the other the one that people pick on the screen is this one. They're pretty similar, aren't they? And so it occurred to me, like, I just, I just want to give the people what they want. <laughs> It seems to me that this one that people pick for the earrings would make maybe nice earrings, and maybe the, the more complicated one that people pick on the screen would make a nice necklace. But how do I find, like, are there more? Um, and I, I scrolled down the list, and I noticed that there was actually a more complicated one that was related. So now the, the, the screen ones have gone up to the earrings, and this one has gone to the necklace. I was like, are there more? Are there more? I just want to, want to find beautiful things to make for people. And through my profound powers of observation, um, I noticed that this is tree location 102, and this is tree location 1002, and if we go back, the simpler one is tree location 12. So it seems like if you just took it and you put zero, more zeros in the middle, you would just get more complicated ones that are similar. They do look similar, right? They're just similar, but a little more complicated. So that, hold that in your mind. And then I went to Israel to meet with Barack Weiss about some other project that I wanted to know about, but he looked at these pentagons that I printed out, and he had a different question. He was like, forget about your other question that you came over here. Let's talk about pentagon trajectories. <laughs> so we did. Okay, so here's Barack's idea. Okay, so here is a trajectory on the double pentagon surface. It's periodic because it comes back to where it starts. It has these four pieces. Um, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give each part its own pentagon. So here is the same thing, but now I've drawn it as four pieces. If I want to turn this double pentagon trajectory into a billiard trajectory, I just have to fold it up. So here, let's fold it up. Doop, doop, doop. Okay? And now, to turn it into a real billiard trajectory, I need to do it five times. So this is the, um, the method to go from a double pentagon trajectory to a billiard trajectory. Okay. Are you ready to like, do it turbo? Okay, so here's Barack's idea. You start with a pentagon trajectory and you twist it. So we're going to do a horizontal shear, which amounts to just twisting the thing like this. So here's what it looks like. Twist, twist, twist. You can imagine like if you had your arm, if you had sleeves, didn't have sleeves, and you twist like this, you get these um, lines on your arm. And that's sort of what's going on here. We're just twisting over and over again. Twist, 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 twist. Twist, twist. How many times should we twist? A lot of times. This many times. Okay? Now, imagine this has, I don't know how many parts, maybe 26 parts or something. We're going to give them all their own pentagon and then fold it up into a billiard trajectory. Sound like a plan? Okay, so for each of those. So here's the first one. This is the one that had just the four parts that we folded up and then it got to 20. And now we're going to do the rest. Are you ready? You ready? Nice. Right? Amazing. 
amazing. It's like a family of similar trajectories. And there's a star that came out of nowhere. Okay. So here's the idea for the, what I'm calling the beautiful family, because the universe says it's the most beautiful. 50% of people agree. Um, so for this, uh, I put the tree location down here. So this original one, like I said, was one, two, and then the rest will be one, zero, two, and things of that form. Are you ready? Okay, here we go. Doesn't it look like you're flying into space? <laughs> beautiful, right? So beautiful. So this is the mechanism that's going on to make these beautiful trajectories. Somehow, this appeals to people more than everything else. Amazing. So, ben, yes. On the last one, are those big stripes themselves trajectories? No. The big stripes, um, like the yeah. stripes. So I'll show you exactly where the stripes come from, but each of these little lines that you can, can't really see right now is a piece of a trajectory. So if but I go, it doesn't have like a fractal thing where the bigger ones are themselves. Oh, no, there's no fractal structure. Too bad. <laughs> Still cool. Yeah, so one thing that you might notice if you go to this wonderful web page is that if you scroll down, it gets kind of boring. Um, because the trajectory is just sort of, the Pentagon just looks black. And I made it so if you click on it, it will get bigger, but even so, if you scroll down further, you know, eventually the resolution is such that it will just be black. These ones that are not black, that's because they have no, they don't have the rotational symmetry, so really they're cheating. We should really do five copies of them. But if you scroll down, maybe they'd be black too. So, the, the conjecture that people have from looking at this, this bunch of things is that as the length of the path increases, periodic billiard trajectories equidistribute, meaning that they just fill in everything the same. What do you think? No, can't happen. This is a counterexample. Because, clearly, uh, this part is denser than this part. So, that's pretty neat. Um, what does happen is as the length of the path increases, periodic billiard trajectories equidistribute in cylinders. So cylinders are those uh, families of the same periodic trajectory moving back and forth that I showed you before. Um, they they equidistribute in cylinders. So I'm going to show you what the mechanism is for making this. So we have a double pentagon. Yeah, question. What does it mean for the path increase? As the length of the path increases, so I guess as you get further out in the family. So if we're looking at these um, these guys, like each path is longer than the one before because it just has more lines. Right, this, the total amount of lines in this picture is less than this one, yeah? There we go. So that wasn't a super uh, rigorous way of stating that, but it's, that's the idea. Okay, so here's what's going on. We start with some trajectory, and now I'm gonna, instead of twisting it in a horizontal direction, I'm gonna twist it in another direction. So we're just twisting it around and around and around and around and around. So we're twisting it in these cylinders, and we're filling out one of the cylinders a lot, and we're not filling out the other cylinder at all. And then we're going to take one of these, or we could just consider that we fold this in half, because they're both the same, and we're going to stamp it around five times. So this one, you might think of it as being sort of a vertical orientation, and we're going to have a vertical uh, orientation from this side. You see how I put that on top? And then there, and then there, and here's the last one. You see it? There it is, and so that's the mechanism for making these things. And so that's how these, these strips uh, that uh, Noah observed come in, because they're from the cylinders in the double pentagon. Yeah. So it's not equidistributed, distributed, but it is very beautiful. Yeah. So I mentioned in the beginning that uh, regular polygons exhibit optimal dynamics, which means that for a given direction, your path is either periodic or dense and equidistributed. It's like you only have two options. And you might wonder, as I wondered when I first heard about this, well, yeah, what else could happen? But here's an example. This is a square billiard table with an irrational rectangle put on the side. And so this path would go and fill up this area, and it would never, ever get into those corners. Can you kind of see how that's going on? Yeah. 
So you might wonder, can this happen on the Pentagon? What do you think? Well, no, it can't because they exhibit optimal dynamics. It's a regular Pentagon, but kind of yes. It's amazing. Check this out. So here is an asymmetrical family. This is it's, this is the true location one two three, and I'm going to add more threes and check out what happens when we go down this branch of the tree. Sorry. Oh, yeah. So it gets longer and longer and longer. These paths get more and more complicated, but they never ever go into this corner. It's amazing. And yet they can get arbitrarily dense. They don't get dense in the usual sense that uh, if you just let the thing run long enough, it gets everywhere. But if you're willing to go far enough out in the tree, you can get close as close as you want to any point. So it's going to be arbitrarily dense if you go out in the family. So um, what I'm wondering and currently working about on and wondering is what is the mechanism? Like, how does it turn out that there's this empty little bit? Also, are there other examples? Because so far, this is the only example that I know of. All right. So... Um, here's what's happening. The first thing I'd like to do is understand the mechanism to go from trajectories on the surface to asymmetrical billiard paths. This uh, is the same direction on the double pentagon and the, the billiard trajectory. Um, this part is not white. I don't know if you can tell, but it's, it's not white. There's trajectory here, and yet when you fold it up, you get something that's empty. How does it work? I don't know. Working on it. Hope to report back. Um, I want to understand why trajectories of symmetry are more common. So as I briefly mentioned, these ones with only reflection symmetry that happens one-sixth of the time, and the ones with the full dihedral group symmetry happens five-sixths of the time. I have a proof. It's because of the group structure of the associated surface, but that's not really snappy. Like if you say, hey, I noticed on your, on your library of trajectories that the ones with symmetry are more common. Why is that? And I could say like, oh, you know, it's five times as common because Pentagon, five. That would be great. I'd love to have an explanation like that. But right now, it's kind of an abstract explanation. And then the other thing is to understand billiard trajectory behavior. We have all these beautiful pictures and we want to know what's going on. So for example, does every even number more than two arise as a billiard period? I can construct the ones with period four, six, eight, and ten. Can we get all the even numbers? You might wonder. Okay. I will admit, this is not the first time that I've given a talk like this. I have copied the slide from before, but check this out. Just on Sunday, we looked into this. And every number, it seems, other than 2, 12, 14, and 18 arises as a billiard period, we think. Okay, that's computational. We don't have a proof, but it's pretty neat, right? Any even number you want, right? you can find a period of trajectory with that period. Pretty cool. Then, okay, fine. So basically every even number arises, everyone other than those four that I said. If, pick your favorite even number. How many have that period? These don't seem like super related, but they both have period 16. He's at period 40, 64. Look at this one, huh? has this hole in the middle, but it's a kind of an asymmetrical hole. Kind of cool. 110. Are they related? I don't know. 120. Okay. And then finally, why are there holes? People ask this to me a lot. They look at a, I mean, look at your Pentagon. It probably has some holes, places where there aren't a lot of parts of trajectory. Why are there holes? The first time I saw this one, I thought, wow, this trajectory was born to be an earring. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't have an explanation for the holes other than what I mentioned, which is that if one has a hole in one place, its buddy, its parallel buddy is likely to have some stuff in that place. But look at these holes, those holes, they're amazing. So I'd like to know about it, and the future is bright. Thank you. <laughs> we have time for a couple questions. Yeah. So you know, like, the, like you have like a DVD player, and there's like that little thing that bounces. <laughs> Okay, yeah. so do you think, based on this research, that like if you lay out the TVs like going one left or the other, after the other, or if you like did it like in the in the Pentagon way, where you get like all the paths, I think it was for that. Like, which way would like hit the line first? 
So Does that make sense? there's a you have uh, your rectangular screen, and usually you have a billiard yeah, bounce yeah, pattern yeah. on the screen, right? Yeah. I I've looked at them, and I think the slope is always one. Oh. Um, I don't really understand the rest of your question. Well, like you know how like you had the thing where you laid them all out, and it was like yes, oh yes, you unfold and you just yeah. Fold so them like, off. do you think that? But does it make a difference? I I guess not. Does it make a difference? Well, I'm just thinking like if you laid them all out versus like if you folded them over first uh, and like you start with the billiard moving, like is there any difference in like when it would arrive at a particular position? I don't think so. There might be a factor of two issue for the torus and the billiard table. Um, because if you get to the same place in the torus, it might be that when you fold it down, it's like a symmetric place in the billiard table, but it's, it's pretty similar. If you have, as a game player, where you have, you have two um, transparency, and you have a small, a grid, a very dense grid on them, and then you rotate it, you can see like some sort of shapes, or I don't know, it's hard to explain. Oh, yeah. Does it, and that's something that comes from like the width of the line. And so because you have yes. to display this like this, do you think some of the, the sort of shapes you see, especially as you get more dense, or it reflects like that? Do you think? Yeah, you certainly the line width makes a difference. Okay. Um, Having played with the laser cutter a lot, sure. and also tried to like try to make these pictures. So when I make this family of trajectories, every time there's a new picture, the line width is slightly smaller, so that okay. it looks right. nicer. So it looks nice because otherwise you would get just black pentagons. Sure. Uh, but the holes, I don't think, are an artifact of the line width. Right. And most of the structure, I think, is not is not an artifact. Um, so you talked about how the, these vectors are canonical, but then you kind of yeah they them. are canonical. I forgot to emphasize that. Yeah. Yes. It turns out they are canonical. There is a canonical vector in every direction, and that our algorithm our algorithm is the one that generates it. So starting with one zero and then applying those matrices gives you the one that you want. It's amazing. We were so lucky. We didn't think we would be that lucky, but we were. It turns out it's the right way to do it. Yeah, please. Um, which trees and cones constitute a family? Do they need to have the same numbers on the ends? Yeah, um, so the, which trees of codes and constitute a family? So I, so I mean, you saw maybe that the way it goes is you start with some word like one, two, and then you just put zeros in it. So, or you start with one, two, three, one, and you put a bunch of threes in it. So that's those constitute families, in my opinion. I would say the way that you get a family is you take a string at the beginning, a string of letter numbers at the beginning, and a string of numbers at the end, and then you pick some other number, and you fill in the middle with copies of that number. So here, your strings are one and two, and you're filling in with zeros. Here, your strings are one, two, and one, and you're filling in with threes. And you're only allowed to fill in with zeros or threes. Do you get any visual patterns on the pentagon? Do you have patterns of the numbers other than just straight repetition? Um, if you do anything other than long strings of zeros and threes, it basically fills up the pentagon very quickly, like uh, equidistributed, oh, very quickly. Okay, okay. Like, uh, for example, um, if you do uh, one, zero, all the way to two with something like um, 15 digits. And then if you do uh, one, two, one, two, that's it. These have the same period. But this one basically just looks black. So if you don't do long strings of zeros or threes, it just fills in. It's not that interesting. Amazing, right? Yeah. yeah. You? Uh, so what, what purpose is this economical? Yeah, the, so the canonical vector, other than just summing the coefficients to get the period, it tells you um, the vector if you were to, if you have a periodic trajectory on the double pentagon and you create a new pentagon for each piece, as we did, it tells you the length of that vector, or the, that vector, from the bottom to the top of the trajectory that you have. So for, it's the same length for every. Pentagon, new pentagon that we draw. It should be the same length. We we uh, give ourselves a new pentagon until we, yeah. it repeats, and it's 
Yeah. And uh, there was a slide where you had shearing from uh, double pentagons into L shapes. Yes. Right? I didn't understand how that went exactly. Okay, the, the mind bending slide? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yep. This one? Yeah. So, uh, over here we have these two purple pentagons, and over here you have two sheared pentagons. And over here you have the golden L as a golden L, and over here you have just the outlines of it. And how do they represent each other? Yeah, if you have some periodic direction over here in the double pentagon, like maybe going from this midpoint to this midpoint, well, you can draw it on this sheared copy of the golden L, and then put the golden L into its rect re rectangular form over here, and it would give you a periodic direction over there. So we can translate back and forth between periodic directions on one or the other, depending on where it's marked. But these missing pieces are not like... Oh, oh yeah, right. This piece, because it's a good point. This piece, this edge is glued to this edge, so this little piece actually fits right up there. And this piece fits right over there. And the same for these parts that are hanging out over here. They go in there. Good point. Good point. Thank you. Um, John? Just have a question about um, kind of the motivation for this kind of research. Is it um, to study kind of horrible behavior in kind of physical systems? Or I'm, I guess I just feel like I'm missing a piece of like context. And kind yeah, of why do we care, right? And also wondering. Um, what does it say about um, other regular octagon, uh, regular uh, polygons? Um, when it is? Yeah, right. What, what do we care, and what are the other yeah, generalizations? Yeah. So, um, for sure, motivation for billiards comes from physics and billiards. Like, if you want to study all the particles that are in this room, there are lots of them. They're bouncing off of everything. It would be easier if we just thought about one particle. And three dimensions is kind of hard, so let's reduce to two dimensions. And now we have a particle <coughs> and a two-dimensional system. So there's billiards. Um, but the real reason we study it is because it's beautiful and it's interesting. So this algorithm that I told you about generating the um, uh, primitive points is related to the Euclidean algorithm. Um, and so this is like and the continued fraction algorithm. So this is a generalization of the continued fraction algorithm, things that people in number theory care about. So I think we're um, out of time, but luckily there it is now. <laughs>